Hello there ladies and gentlemen, I am David Game and welcome to the PlayStation 4 Rogue Legacy Level Zero Run. I am, as I've said, David Game and I already recorded this commentary once, but I couldn't fix the, uh, the audio volume so I had to sort that out separately. Anyway, so we're here playing Rogue Legacy, this came out, I evangelised the crap out of this on Steam back in the day when it first got released because I was so enamoured with it. Um, I don't even know what made me buy it, I just I just went for it. And it turned out to be probably the best purchase of a game I've ever made. And it was 15 quid back then. You can get it on the PlayStation for... and free. <laughs> but for £8 if you're a PlayStation Plus member and £10 if you're not a PlayStation Plus member. And that gets you access to it on the PlayStation 4, 3 and the Vita. Which, you know, the Vita doesn't get a lot of love. So we enjoy seeing the Vita get some of that love in. Now, Rogue Legacy is what they like to call a Rogue Light, not a Rogue Like, um, because apparently it's substantially more uh, accessible than a Rogue Like. Uh, anyway, the point is that you've got a castle. There, some dude went in and killed a king, and now you're going in to find the traitor. And you and all of your children are going to go and try and get this traitor, take him down. And you got to do that by fighting a real bunch of, you know, what do they call them? A wackadaisical, <laughs> which is not actually a word, um, bunch of enemies that get randomly generated each time that you go into the dungeon. So it's not always the same dungeon, which is what makes the game so difficult. Now again, yes, the game is difficult, but it's rewardingly difficult. It's difficult not because the game's unfair. Although sometimes there are moments where you'll walk into the castle and the first room will be like, you know, just spikes. And you're like, really? Like, <laughs> you know, it's not impossible, but it's like, ah, come on. Luck of the draw, but at the same time, it's all about how skillfully you play, and that's why I enjoy it so much. And I said to my cousin yesterday, we were talking about it, and it's like, basically, the game is... Everyone talks about, like, the difficulty of Dark Souls because it's such a mainstream game. Right? If Dark Souls is the mean kid that knocked the ice cream out of your hand... Rogue Legacy is the game, it's the CEO that bought all of the ice cream in the world and refused to sell you any of the ice cream. It got a monopoly on the ice cream. That's how mean this game can be. <laughs> but uh, I decided to do a level zero run completely off the bat because PlayStation 4 has the good old shadow recordings. So I was able to retrieve this. I had no intention of actually recording it. Um, yeah, so the whole idea behind Rogue Legacy is to go in knowing what your character can do, how many how many hits the enemies can take, um, and essentially it never ends because you can keep going back going back for new game plus, and every time the castle and the enemies level up, and well, basically you can just give yourself more of a challenge. And I'm kind of upset because I've platinum this now, which means I don't have any more reason to play it. To platinum it, you've got to play through it twice, you've got to get through it. One trophy in particular is very difficult, where you've got to get through it in 15 deaths or less. I managed, I think it was 14, I was really lucky, because the final boss is a complete and utter uh, something I don't want to say in order to not, you know, <laughs> in order to so I don't alienate the listeners. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's many functions to the whole place. You get blueprints, it's an upgradable castle. I'm not saying it was so much enthusiasm, because it's really hard to get across why you should buy this game without playing it. You're seeing me play it now, and you're probably thinking, yeah, this looks good, but what's so special about it? There's a feeling when you play this game that it's like everything's in your control, and I really enjoy that about games. And... You can't, I can't review this because I have too much of a high appreciation for it. And, well, it wouldn't really matter anyway. I mean, IGN have already reviewed it. Plenty of places have already reviewed it to the point where uh, my review would be somewhat moot. But the point is that the game is worth playing. If you're watching me play it for the first time right now, then this should be the selling point for you. That I, I can sometimes overpromise on some stuff. I'm not even going to lie, because I get such an enthusiasm for the things I like that it becomes a bit of a detriment. This is one of the things where I could sell this to you on so many different levels, and I would never regret anything I'd said to you. If you didn't like it, I wouldn't... I mean, I'd acknowledge it, but I wouldn't understand why you can't appreciate something of this magnitude. It's such a good game. 
Anyway, there's uh, let's talk some more about the actual game. That was the Hyperion's Ring that I just took from a shrine. Uh, you get shrines sometimes around the castle, uh, depending on the generation, of course. And the Hyperion's Ring allows you to come back to life once after you die. So, it's very helpful, providing, obviously, you know, hey, basically it's for reckless behaviour. You don't want to die in gem, but if you mess up or something becomes particularly unfair, you'll uh, defy death with that ring, guaranteed. Now, we're running along here, gathering chests. Uh, obviously, our, my main goal for this whole run was pretty much, you know, get as far as you can on the first run to upgrade your castle as much as possible. So I can go in and have a better shot at attaining this uh, trophy you get for not dying. Uh, you can't use the architect either, by the way, the person that locks the castle to the last uh, the last design, so you know where you're going. So basically, you've got to get into the randomly generated dungeon each time, and then go again with these new characters. You get a random three children after you die, and you get to pick between them, different classes. The class you start off as with Sir Lee is uh, the Knight, which you can upgrade to a Paladin, but that's all uh, all stuff you really need to figure out in the game anyway. Um, now, with the Paladin, uh, the Knight rather, call him a Paladin because obviously you can't kind of forget what their original things were. Uh, with the Knight, it's the best all rounder. It's got the best uh, physical, uh, the best all round physical, magic, and general survivability. It doesn't excel, it's like using Mario in Mario Kart. It's like, yeah, you know, I can get through with this. No risk. But of course, here we go. I mean, I'm finding it difficult. This, uh, I'd rather have somebody else here to talk to about it, but I've only got a headset on. <laughs> Here's the bus door. We've got the Kadir bus door. And there's always two chests around every bus door that you go to, so it's always good to at least find the bus doors as well. Get as much treasure and chest as you can to take through to your next play. Now here I was like, ah, do I try and take him on? I don't think I can take him on without the dash rune, the sprint rune, which allows you to like mid-air dash and dash along the floor quickly. Kadir does an attack that attacks you if you don't use that. But then I went, eh, let's give it a go. Here he is, the expanding eyeball, Kadir. The gatekeeper, even. So, basically Kadir has three patterns of attack. And he uses them in several different ways. This one here is the seemingly random spitting out of fireballs. Uh, this is where you, you basically just gotta dodge in the right direction and you'll be fine. He does this for a little bit, if, uh, if I recall correctly. He, uh, it, but he'll do the attacks in whatever way he wants to do them. This one's a more uniform attack, in, out, in, out. So it's kind of, you know, playing a bit of the hokey pokey. Why is it the hokey pokey? I can't remember the dance. Anyway, there's another attack there, the clockwise spray. You need to run away from that, and hopefully you're on the right side of it when you do run away. Now, I like to be on the right side of Kadir, so being on the left side is a bit weird. Um, but if you don't have the sprint rune, you are going to take damage from a clockwise attack that goes the wrong way, like this. See, you cannot jump over him without the addition to any of your movement runes. So... You need to hope he does the clockwise attack, not the anti-clockwise. And you just need to jump to the ledge and you're fine. Da -da -da. There are also spike traps to your right and left. That's why I'm not using the far right of the arena, as you can see. If you don't have the pad ability, which is a, a trait that some of your characters get when they're born. Genetic traits and whatnot. Then uh, you create no foot pulls and you can stand on them. Makes Kadir a bit easier. But to be honest, you can beat Kadir regardless, uh, even with just a sprint run, as long as you know the tactics. Now here, yep, I took another hit there, so things got a bit tense. It was like, oh no, Sir Lee, I think you're going to die, I'm not going to be able to upload this, when I'm going to have to start again. But no, here I was, hacking away, the determination, and it took him down, poked him right in the eye. And as you can see, treasure pours from the pupil. And a chest appears. I've been David Game, and check out the next video, which is going to show you like the super end game kind of business. Bizzle!